Hello everyone and welcome to YWCA Australia's Young Women's Budget Briefing. I'd also like to just extend a special uh, welcome to Senator Claire Moore. It's great to have you here with us this evening. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Zoya Patel and I'll be your MC tonight. Um, and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we meet on and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So YWCA Australia and the ANU Gender Institute are very proud to be bringing you tonight's event. Um, and we'll be distilling the federal budget and um, the measures that have been announced into some bite-sized information chunks for you all. Um, YWCA Australia is the National Association of YWCAs in Australia and is part of the World YWCA Movement. Uh, they are a women-led organisation that achieves positive change by providing advocacy, programs and services for women, families and communities. The ANU Gender Institute is a virtual institute um, across campus and provides a focus for existing activity on issues of gender and sexuality and is a catalyst to develop um, and deepen them. So Claire Southerton from the Institute is here today um, and she's got some sign-up sheets for their mailing list. Strongly encourage you to pop your email address down there and make sure that you get all the updates on their events and activities. Um, and to just introduce myself a little bit more, I work at YWCA Canberra. I'm their communications and advocacy officer um, and I also do various things around town in the feminist media space. So the aim for tonight's event is really to give you an explanation of the federal budget process um, that you can understand. Um, also to give you a bit of a roundup of the budget announcements and um, how they will affect women and young women specifically. Um, and also to give you the chance to ask our expert panel whatever questions you might have. So definitely start thinking of those. You can participate online by tweeting any thoughts you have to at YWCA Oz, um, and the hashtag for tonight is YWBudget. If you're feeling shy and don't want to ask a question in person tonight, you can always tweet it to us and I can read it out for you. So um, start preparing those now. And I'll just kick off by introducing our panel. They all have um, you know, huge and lengthy areas of expertise, so please excuse me while I read directly off this page so I get it all right. Um, so um, on the far right, we have Yen Erickson. Yen is a Communications and Project Coordinator for YWCA Australia. She's also the Vice Chair of 2XX Community Radio. She has a background in community media as well as LGBTIQ advocacy and feminist ad activism. She's been a sitting member of the ACT LGBTIQ Ministerial Advisory Council and she was also a SIN Young Media Leader as part of the National Youth Media Project, which helps empower regional young people to find their voice through uh, media making. And on Tuesday, she was a member of the 2SER Federal Budget Coverage Team as part of a national community radio initiative where she contributed to Channel 31 television coverage of the federal budget. So she should be all across it by now. <laughs> um, next, we have Professor Miranda Stewart. Uh, Miranda is Director of the Tax and Transfer Policy Institute at the ANU Crawford School of Public Policy. Miranda's research focuses on tax law and policy, including taxation of business entities in the context of globalization, not-for-profits, tax and development, budget laws and institutions, and legitimacy of tax reform processes and institutions nationally and internationally. Recent books include, um, as a co-editor, not-for-profits law, sham transactions and tax law and development. And as a co-author, Miranda has uh, published Death and Taxes <laughs> and Cooper Creamer <laughs> Cooper oh, Creamer Van, Income Taxation, Commentary and Material. We absolutely should read this yeah. out. <laughs> 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 and before her appointment at ANU, Miranda was a professor at Melbourne Law School at the University of Melbourne and also at New York University School of Law, um, which is the leading international tax program in the US. And of course we have to read all that out, Miranda, so everyone understands that you're the person to go to <laughs> for all of the technical questions that we have tonight. Um, we have Dr. Caroline Lambert here with us. Caroline is the Executive Officer of YWCA Australia, um, having been with the YWCA since 2005, and she has a long-term interest in women's human rights and gender equality issues in Australia and internationally. Over a 25-year period, Caroline has been involved in a range of community organisations, including the Women's, right, Women's Rights Action Network Australia, IWRAW Asia Pacific, Amnesty International, Women's Housing Limited, the National Foundation for Australian Women, the Victorian Foundation of the Survivors of Torture, and Arts Access Victoria. Caroline's doc 
doctorate examined the intersections of trade and human rights law using a feminist critique of liberal, polit liberal political and economic theory. She is the co-author of Critical Chatter, Women and Human Rights Activism in Southeast Asia, and co-edited Global Issues, Women and Justice. So great to have you with us, Caroline. And finally, I have Hannah Gassain here right next to me. Hannah is the project officer of the Equality Rights Alliance. Uh, she was also one of the youngest women ever to be elected to a city council and had a four-year term on the Lake Macquarie City Council. While on council, Hannah ensured that gender diversity was included as a key performance indicator for the organization, and she worked to mandate affordable housing provisions in a new residential development. Hannah has a key mind for government mechanisms and an enthusiasm for ABS statistics. I didn't write that bit. <laughs> <laughs> she was also in a budget lock-up on Tuesday, so she'll be able to paint a vivid picture of what that was like. So I'm gonna get stuck in with a question that I'd really like to hear from everyone on, and that is that in your view, you know, what is the federal budget and why should young women care about it? So yeah, maybe you can give us off. Sure, so um, as the very informative video you all just saw explained, it was voiced by my little sister as well, so <laughs> props to her. Um, the federal budget is a central policy turnpike for the government, right? When the, when the federal government is planning and plotting its successful suite of policies or its potentially evil suite of policies, it's hinging them all off the federal budget process. And I think for lots of um, not-for-profits um, and people who are invested in understanding what the government agenda is gonna hold, the federal budget is kind of the indicator for what their plan is for the coming year and into the next few years. And it's also really interesting from a political analysis point of view around um, what the, t the sentiment or the temperament of the current government is in terms of comparing the first their first budget to their second budget to their third budget. And I mean, we can talk a little bit more about that. Why young women should be interested in it is because young women should be interested in federal policy. Um, it affects them in more ways than perhaps you're always aware, but as you become more aware of it, you want to have more capacity to influence it, and the more aware of it and the more engaged and clicked in you are with it, the more you can change it to actually benefit you. Absolutely. Um, and Miranda, I imagine you take a, a slightly more high level approach to what the budget means to Australia? Well, I wouldn't want to abstract it too much. Uh, so the budget is really a political document. And I, uh, I gave a talk recently where I did this sort of big thing of budget is the central political and economic document of our democracy. And you say that and you say, okay, let's move on. So you don't want to overstate it, its rhetoric, rhetorical significance. Uh, so I, I look at the budget, someone said to me, well, there's all these budget papers, they're more here actually, they're like little souvenirs of yeah. <laughs> physical, actual real physical books. Um, are you a budget paper one person or a budget paper <laughs> two person? <laughs> so I'm a budget paper one person, I do look at budget paper two as well. So what that means is that I look at the overall fiscal context. I'm interested in the budget as a document that presents the overall taxing and spending situation for the country and the projections going forward, which are not just economic, they are political, actually, not just economic, because they contain a lot of assumptions about what, uh, where the economy is going. I'm interested in where the tax revenue is coming from and what changes are projected in that and why that might have increased or decreased. And I am interested in budget paper too, but mostly the treasury policy and the social security policy. So the policy about cash in, cash out of government, if you like the way that we're raising that money uh, and the way that we're sort of directly spending our cash out uh, to uh, individuals and families. Why should young women care? Well, we can go, we'll talk more in the whole session, I guess, but young women are taxpayers. Uh, even if young women are not earning a lot of money, uh, they're taxpayers. We have a consumption tax, we have taxes embedded in fuel and tobacco and alcohol and uh, young women bear all of these taxes. Uh, they also study and have debt, uh, education debt, and of course uh, they are also potentially receiving transfer of payments and they should have a very substantial voice in my opinion in helping to decide that policy going forward. Caroline, I'm guessing that you're more of a budget paper two person, which might surprise me. <laughs> why do you think the federal, or I suppose, yeah, what do you think the role of the federal budget is? Um, and yeah, why should young women be concerned about it? I am a budget paper too, girl. Um, <laughs> budget, so budget paper, that's that one. <laughs> and it, it's the show us the money document. Um, for me, the federal budget, it's, it's the social contract.
contract between all of us, between us and the state, in dollars and cents. Um, we, you know, if we go back to Western liberal theory, we give up some of our freedoms in exchange for a range of goods and services that the government provides. The budget is the expression of the values of our community, or not, as the case may be. Um, and so, to me, it's, you know, I get tremendously excited and a little bit giddy going into budget lockup, and it's not because of the good food, because <laughs> there isn't good food. Um, but it's this, it's, it's this annual opportunity to see the values of our community writ large through political process and through the dollars and cents. And so I look to budget paper two, which sets out where the government's going to make savings and where they're going to make expenditure. And so I'm looking as a, as a head of a not-for-profit um, who's interested in the equality of women in the community, I'm looking to see that the measures that they're introducing aren't going to disproportionately affect women in our community. So are some of the savings measures that they're putting forward going to have a worse impact for girls and chicks in the community than for blokes? And I'm also looking to see whether or not the commitments that they make to us in elections are being carried through into the allocations that they're making for the way that my taxpayer dollar is spent. Absolutely. And Hannah, from your perspective? Um, well, first of all, Budget Paper 2 and 3. Um, I've also almost forgotten Budget Paper 1 exists, so I'm glad you <laughs> brought it to our attention, <laughs> Miranda. Um, budget Paper 3 is the Federal Financial Relations yes. and shows all the money that goes to states, which is also very pertinent for yes, services yes. and programs. Um, I think it's interesting, I'm just reflecting on a young women's budget event, which, you know, is not doesn't happen every day, does it? Um, I'm interested in this because the political messaging around budget time is not directed to young women. It's directed to women in the family unit, women as families, women as uh, workers in you know small business. These are the kind of, this is the rhetoric and the language around um, budget time. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm interested in this sort of um, mobilising young women as a constituency, as a um, political force, as, um, you know, as a constituency around budget time because it's not, you know, it's really not part of the sort of mainstream political messaging with the budget. Yeah, and I think it'll be interesting as we go forth with tonight to talk a bit more about how that might actually be a massive failure in the way that the budget is communicated um, because I think we'll see how the budget influences each and every one of us quite closely. Um, now, this has been a big week for you guys with the budget obviously being announced on Tuesday. I was wondering if um, Hannah and Caroline, you could tell us a bit about what budget lockup looks like and what the point of it is, so what it's really meant to be there for. Um, I, I've got an interesting view on budget lockup because I think it's completely unnecessary and it's this <laughs> sort of antiquated um, ritual we hold on to because it makes us feel good. Do people know what budget lockup is or would you like a basic um, explanation? Maybe, maybe a quick wrap up of what it actually entails. Well, there are two, two, right? There's the media one. They get to go in a bit earlier than us humble community folk. And then there's the stakeholder lockup from 3.30 onwards. And the idea... Actually, there's also <laughs> states and territories. Oh, there's so, states and territories. And there's another room for tax office people and sort of technical bureaucrats <laughs> who haven't seen the budget yet. Yeah. Oh. So there's more going on yeah. even. Oh, well. and, and there used to be a whole stack more. So you used to have, like, different departments did lockups and now we've come back just to treasury really kind of hosting <laughs> everybody. And you're literally yeah. locked in a room. Yeah, there's this yeah. really interesting ritualistic element to it that these everyone sort of starts marching downstairs at 3.30 after, you know, giving over your phones and promising not to connect to the internet and all of this sort of, um, you know, rigmarole. You actually sign a thing yeah. that says if you leak anything to the budget, you're willing you will, you will go to prison for this, two years. Yeah, the crime fact is brought out. Yeah, it's really <laughs> intense. <laughs> um, and, yeah, you, you just settle down and then they just pile you with paperwork. And everyone's got a different approach. Yeah, um, there's the budget paper one. There's the pe There are some people who bother with the media releases. Um, <laughs> you know, there's the, there are the overviews, which are the glossy sort of pamphlets. And then there, there's the guts of it, which is in these um, papers here. The glossies, the glossies, <laughs> yeah. <to> families, <laughs> yeah. and, and they're Jobs. useful because they give you an early insight into the rhetoric yeah. 
that the government is going to use to sell the budget. I particularly this year um, enjoyed Doug, the farmer. The graphics were <laughs> particularly high quality this year. Um, there's Doug and his farmer cow um, going over an electric fence, I presume. And look, it's possible that we may have broken some regulations during budget lockdown because we, we added the moon to most of the budget documents that we had. And so what are you, what are you looking for when you are reading these documents, Caroline? Like, you know, the glossies and the full papers, I assume you're going through them as a highlighter. Yeah. And so what are the types of things that you're looking yeah. for? So for us, the budget night and the lockup is simply one part of our process. So every election, the YWCA will run a, an election campaign where we identify the things that we think governments should make commitments to, to improve the lives of young women and women in the Australian community. And so we use that then as the basis for our budget submission. Um, which we send in. And so when we get into the lockup, what we're looking for, first of all, is have the things that we asked for been uh, allocated funds or have they been cut in this budget? Um, and so we'll, we'll use the budget overview documents, we'll go into the papers two and three, we'll have a look. There's yellow papers as well, which give you kind of further detail. Um, and so we'll look to see, uh, kind of against our asks, what's won and what's lost. But then we also do a more general reading to kind of try and get a sense of, well, from a gender equality perspective, what's a gain and what's a loss. And then we do a kind of stepping it back another level of, and so what's the story the government's going to tell us this year? And how might we frame our response in a way which recognises the linguistic tools that they're using um, and kind of works with and against? Um, so that's that's probably it. And you know, look, there are there are people who have a really specific focus, and they go in with spreadsheets which bring up all of the patterns on spending from years past. And you know, we'll go and ask them for the for the details. It's actually a very collegiate thing. And so, while yes, I know it's antiquated, and we go into a dungeon. I find it incredibly helpful because it means that I can go up, and I might not be the full bottle on uh, higher education policy, but I know that NUS will be in the room and I can go and ask them what the story is and I can go and ask the aid colleagues how the Overseas Development Assistant budget has fared or not. Um, and so we begin to start getting a sense on budget night in the lockup of how we as a sector are going to respond. But it's not just the community sector that's in there, there's the business sector in there as well. Um, and so it's, it's a real hodgepodge and you start to get a sense of, well, what's the, what, what are going to be the areas that the government's going to have an easy win on and what are they going to have trouble with? I think it's really interesting that you describe the community lockup as this, like, everyone's holding hands and sharing feelings and talking about their certain area of expertise. Because when you go into the media lockup, you go in at lunchtime, um, they kind of field you into this little like farm cornered off area on the second floor of parliament and you're like rubbing shoulders with everyone's favourite journalist, right? Like I almost touched Annabelle's crab's hair. <laughs> <laughs> like going into that little gap, right? And so... I think then, she's the source <laughs> of the budget paper one, budget paper two person. <laughs> she yeah. away. So yeah. I should probably attribute yeah. that. But <laughs> everyone goes in um, and the big media have already set up all of their, like, their things, right? And the small media have to go in and sort of squeeze in in the middle. Right? And so, the, and there's a real sense of competition. We were in the same room as The Guardian, and every time I would start saying something interesting, suddenly The Guardian editor would stop talking and just be like listening to what we were saying. Right? And there was this kind of vibe that like you didn't want them to like grab your bit of analysis and then run with it because with, for the media, it's a, it's a competition. It's a competition about who's going to get this line of sight across the story that's actually the most compelling. And then who's going to find the little things in there that the other media orgs didn't find. And going in with community media is especially good because the whole idea with community media is that we're looking for the things that the mainstream media aren't even looking at, right? So we did a lot of coverage around things like um, the effects of the, <coughs> the housing funding, the, the ins and outs of the childcare package beyond the sort of like the high level, like this is what's happening. And, and, and you know, really like down to, down to the dirty analysis for the common folk, the community broadcast listening audience, you know, is understood to be. And so, but the, it definitely isn't the same kind of energy of like, 
you can just grab your friend from the other room and be like, oh, did you find this thing? Because it's actually, yeah. <laughs> it's like an open room exam. For your enemy. Yeah. 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 Um, we've mentioned a couple of some of the key kind of budget announcements and measures um, now. So I wonder if um, we could go through the panel and just, you know, get an idea of what your first impressions of the budget were from your unique perspective. So I might just start with Hannah. Um, sure. So at Equality Rights Alliance, uh, one of our key focuses is on affordable housing. So a pleasant surprise, well it wasn't a surprise because it was announced, but something pleasant for, for us was um, two, two years of funding for the National Partnership Agreement on Homelessness. And actually the fact that that had been previously announced was actually a nice thing <coughs> because that's the type of funding where um, if people hadn't found out that it had been refunded before the budget, uh, people in services would have been losing their jobs and um, would have been quite chaotic. So I, that was that was a surprise. That speaks to my my larger happiness and joy at pr announcements prior to the budget. I thought that was a, a better way of doing things uh, for this year. Yeah, absolutely. So normally you're saying that you wouldn't you wouldn't hear about those kinds of things. Uh, until it's not that there's a. I suppose there's a way of doing it every year. It's just that last year a lot of everything was sort of wait until budget night, and so it was good to sort of get a much clearer idea of how it would roll. Yeah, absolutely. What about for you, Caroline? Yeah, so, I mean, look, a pleasant moment. Um, the commitment to early childhood education at a meta level, um, you know, is a, a good thing with um, the capital G and T because, um, you know, getting investment into early years is really, really critical for child welfare outcomes as well as supporting women's workforce participation and attachment. Um, I think, you know, my colleagues in the disability sector felt that, you know, after years of really quite punitive measures around um, disability and work requirements, um, that they felt that perhaps there was some movement in listening to, it's the beginning, the way they characterised it, it's the beginning of a, a, a new approach and, and they welcomed that. Yeah, the cut to small business. I, I, I like to try and read, sorry, Hannah, and think more broadly. So the cut to small, bu uh, small business taxation rate by 1.5%, 40% of the employees in small business are, are women. And so that could theoretically have a flow through. I always like to look at the infrastructure spend um, on the basis that women spend a hell of a lot of time in cars on roads. Um, and I'm waiting for the day when we get a women in car lobby um, into the budget locker so that we can have some specific analysis on that topic. Um, so I do think it's worth looking at that. Um, look, I guess you know, some of the... Am I allowed to talk about the disappointments yet? I forgot, did you ask that question? I we were absolutely, we were, but you know, I would love to hear about it. No, okay. Yeah, glass half full person, <laughs> like Joe <Jim> Hockey. <laughs> you know, I am profoundly optimistic most yes. weeks. Um, I'm not always sure that the optimism carries through to the end of budget week. Um, look, I'm not sure that Mother's Day presented a great gift to, to the, the women in Australia. Um, you know, the, the backflip on paid parental leave and the universal scheme um, is a real loss for, for women and men and those who float between who have kids. Um, and I, I think, you know, we co-fund retirement in this country, we co-funding health, we co-fund education. Why can we not co-fund paid parental leave? Why are we seeing women and men who access paid parental leave from the government being characterised as double dippers, being characterised as frauds. It's completely unreasonable and it's not what the scheme, not the way the scheme was set up. Um, sorry, I see a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering, you mentioned earlier looking at the budget, trying to figure out sort of linguistic tools, stories that the government's going to use and how you will respond to them. And I think in the last couple of days we've seen Labor really focus on that We all, to some extent, do that. So, you know, we wrote our press release um, and we used the language of lifters uh, and lifting in the press release because it's got some traction. What we're trying to do is bring the issues 
of importance to women in Australia into the mainstream political analysis. Uh, and so what we have found is that if you use language that has got some resonance within the political reportage of that week, then you're more likely to, to get some traction with what you're saying. Um, you know, from my perspective on paper and leave, um, I think that it is really, I think it was a, a, an error of judgment to characterise parents as double dippers. Um, and I think that you're seeing, you know, Malcolm Turnbull, like Senator Dinos had this today, come out and said, actually, no, what we need to, it's, it's not right to characterise parents in that way. Um, and what we were having to do was make hard budget decisions about where we're going to allocate funding. And childcare is equally as important in women's workforce attachment as, as paid parental leave. And so for that reason, you know, we're, we're achieving budget cuts. You know, so, and, and the family tax benefit be, you know, to pay, to take the savings from that area, from single income families and, and sole parents, um, so that we can we can achieve new funding models in childcare is also problematic. I mean, I was going to say that I think that the reason there's a focus on the rhetoric is because the budget is political, right? Mm -hmm. and, it's a political and, document. Yeah. And the way that, you know, either side of politics is going to win or lose on certain budget lobbying is going to be around the rhetoric of the budget. They're not going to be talking about, like, this line item of this portfolio that said this. You know, I mean, they will at estimates, at certain estimates, but the, the actual game of being able to push back or not, or stop, for example, like the way that the co-payment went down last year, I mean, that was actually a back and forward over the rhetoric around it and the conversation around it and how you convince different stakeholders and different politicians to support or not support it. And we saw the same thing with the higher ed deregulation policies last year. And I mean, that battle is won in, in rhetoric. It's not won in terms of debates over how the, the math lines up necessarily, at least I think that's how can I make a comment on that, Nate, on your question? I think I do think language is very important, and one of the positives that I saw about the budget is actually that it was fairness is written all over it. So not that I'm necessarily saying I think all the budget is fair, but last year there was no fairness was not really a part of the government's discourse, and I think one of the things that they have learned is actually that the Australian people would like fairness to be a core principle mm. in budget policy. And so they have to embrace that. They can't just let go of that narrative. So that, to me, is a positive. Uh, on the other hand, what you need to do is work out, do you really think this is fair? And, and who, you know, what, who, if you claim something is fair, is it really fair by some kind of more objective measure? Um, the Labor double-dipping thing, I think there's a real risk there, actually, because Labor, if they get into power or if they were they're going to be just as constrained by the fiscal deficit and the hard budget decisions. They, they, they tie themselves to a very tight fiscal policy. Uh, they've capped themselves, uh, it, as a matter of public record, the, the maximum amount of tax they think the federal government should collect at the same level as the conservative government. Uh, I mean, to me, that's a crazy thing to do, but both governments have tied them, both sides of politics have tied themselves into this very tightly constrained fiscal policy. Uh, and so, although they may say we don't like double dipping, they're, they're going to make just as many decisions that will have these impacts on, on women as the Conservatives will because they have tied themselves up in this tight fiscal policy. Um, I'd like to hear from Yen about what you thought about, um, I guess, budget announcements and your impressions. But before we do that, while we're talking about tax, um, I was actually wondering, Miranda, if you could talk a bit about what the tax and transfer system is, um, first of all, and then how it relates to kind of working and, and work. Sure, and look, I think, well, it's up to you, but I'm happy to take questions on, on that rather than Absolutely. going through a list of measures. Um, but when we say transfer, it's a technical term. Uh, uh, so tax and transfer, transfer is kind of cash out, uh, basically. So I think of it as cash in, cash out. So taxes, are obviously, you know what they are. Um, transfers are welfare or social security it might be another way to think about that, uh, that kind of payment. So of course governments spend a lot of money to fund education and to fund health and to fund roads and so on, but I'm talking about uh, rather than government owned funding paying cash out to individuals. Uh, so, you know, in the budget there are these measures, the small business measures on the tax side, cutting taxes there. 
uh, for families, the childcare payment is a part of the transfer system, so that the, the establishment and then the administration of that childcare payment. The point that um, Caroline made about family tax benefit B, so currently in the Senate from last year's budget, still not passed uh, from last year's budget, uh, is uh, a measure that uh, would withdraw that payment to single parents, of course mostly single mothers, uh, once their children reach six, uh, and then they may need to access other income support like unemployment benefit, for example, which is uh, less generous. Uh, so that, that has a revenue raising consequence or rather a cost saving consequence and they want to fund the childcare partly from the, from the fact that they will withdraw that benefit. So that's the link that you're making. Uh, which is horribly problematic. Which is, you know, I mean, I think that's up for negotiation. We'll have to see what happens. They'll want to pass this budget in the Senate and they may compromise on that measure. We don't know. Uh, a couple of other things to identify. They did, uh, although they say they're not introducing new taxes, they are, uh, and in particular, or extending the existing tax bases uh, somewhat. And so this sort of Netflix extending the GST to uh, online streaming, uh, and also the multinational anti-avoidance rule, which I can talk more about uh, if people are interested. Uh, I think those are, are good things, actually. And they've also done a few bit of tightening up in the personal income tax that you wouldn't even see, because it's not in any of the media, but in my view, it's a good thing. And I'm not sure about women in cars, because <laughs> one of the things they've done is they've tightened up what is called the Turak tractor deduction, uh, which is a deduction, a particular way of deducting the cost of vehicles, uh, large vehicles. Um, and they're going to save nearly a billion dollars over four years uh, by tightening up that deduction. So, you know, that's a good thing, uh, I think, in the budget. Yeah, absolutely. I would actually be interested in hearing more about the Netflix tax thing, because I imagine it's the kind of thing that would affect us. Um, <laughs> so I won't ask how many people are using VPNs GST applies in general uh, to consumption of goods and services in Australia. Uh, it's what we call the destination-based consumption tax. So it's intended to tax where the consumption takes place, where you finally use that good or service or eat that food, or except for it's exempt, but anyway, eat that takeaway food. Um, so, however, uh, online purchasing, so when we had the GST 15 years ago, there was much less online shopping, of course, uh, and online streaming, there's no streaming really. Uh, and so what the Netflix tax, Netflix tax uh, does is that it aims to extend the collection of the GST, the 10% GST, to digital streaming, digital electronic content. Um, that content is consumed in Australia, you watch it here. So it is appropriate that we extend the tax. The big challenge has been administrative because the supplier is offshore. Uh, we don't have a retailer or a restaurant from whom we can withhold the tax. That's how we collect GST. We don't collect it from you guys when you go to the restaurant. We collect it from the restaurant. Uh, so what we're doing, what they're doing with this tax in cooperation with other countries actually is to try to bring these big digital content suppliers into the regulatory net to require them to withhold and remit. Uh, and they will pass on the, the tax in the price of the goods or services they supply. So it might be an initial pinch, but everyone should adjust and be able to stream their television as per usual. Look, uh, that content is still so much cheaper than it would be if you were to buy domestically, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> I don't think it'll change your decision. Well, that is a relief. Um, <laughs> there might actually be you know, more pertinent um, issues for young women in the budget, Caroline. I wonder if you could talk about what you think young women should be taking note of um, when we're looking at both the budget, but also the commentary around the budget um, and the way it's being spoken about. So I think there's a, a number of issues, and I'm happy to defer to genuine young women uh, on the panel <laughs> on this as well. Because I'm not speaking to yourself, Caroline. I think what's young anyway? The yeah, constitution, so, and I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, look, the government affects our everyday existence through our ability to access doctors, through our ability to access education through our ability to access 
employment benefits when we need support through our ability to access good roads, because I do like infrastructure. Um, but I also think of infrastructure in a broader way. It's not just about roads, it's about the social infrastructure. So when we're looking at the budget, having a look to see, you know, last year if you were reading budget papers, you would have been freaked out like I was at the thought of having to make a co-payment to go see a GP. And for women who are still the primary caregivers, because we have such strong gender stereotypes that say that only girls can look after kids, um, which we know is erroneous. Um, but because women are the primary caregivers still, um, things like co-payments for health, we're having women at water table, water cools around the world talking about around the country, you know, whether or not that would mean that they would now not be going to see a doctor if they need to go see a doctor. Um, in this budget, for young women looking at the education reform packages that are still on the table, deregulation still on the table, they introduced changes in this budget around repayment of university um, debts if you're overseas. Um, looking at um, things like the changes to the pharmaceutical benefits scheme in the last budget, and there's still some flow through in that. I think looking at things like the early childhood education system um, and the types of programs that are being supported through that, the cuts we've talked about to family tax benefit B. Um, Hannah will talk about the housing, um, but you know, there's a range of measures, and I think the pay parental leave one is really the biggest issue for, for women and their ability to plan for if they want to have kids, the type of income support that they'll be able to put together. Superannuation is still not in the parental leave package that is funded by the Australian Government. And when you look at the fact that on average, Australian, or women in Australia retire with a million bucks less than men, in their retirement savings. The fact that we don't get superannuation for a period of time that we're out of the workforce, looking after the next generation of workers and taxpayers is a really concerning mm. issue. You know, I, the other thing about that stat that's really interesting is that um, over your lifetime, if you don't go to university, you'll earn about a million dollars less than someone who does go to university. And so the equivalent of the pay gap in terms of super and the way that affects you is about that same thing to give you perspective on like how intense that kind of inequality is and how that translates across the lifetime of a woman. And in fact that leads really nicely into my next question which was for you Yen. Um, everything that Caroline said is quite concerning but obviously that concern grows when we talk about intersectionality and the way that diverse groups um, might experience those same measures. So I was wondering if you could talk about um, I guess how we engage um, diverse groups and diversity in this conversation when we're talking about yeah. you know measures that will affect every Australian um, and inherently impact yeah. on some Australians more than others. Yeah, it's an interesting question because I think the burden of actually reading any kind of other lens other than the white man's lens into the budget is on the burden of everyone else because the government certainly doesn't do that. We don't have um, a, a women's budget anymore, like the Office for Women used to put out. Yeah, and we have Doug, right, as Doug. the example. <laughs> yeah, and so the and families. Yes. 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 Families. Sorry. yes. yes. And on the second page of yes. this glossy, I really enjoyed yeah. that the family was like an Asian. 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 woman. There's only kids. On it was like an Asian yeah. family. I was like, oh, some PR oh. person was doing their job. Um, <laughs> but um, the the thing is. The, the heavy lifting of interpreting budget measures and the way that they're going to affect people in diverse demographics has to be done by NGOs and media organisations. And unfortunately, mainstream media organisations often don't do that themselves, at least not in the first week. It takes a while until stakeholder engagement comes up. But I think, um, and so at first, there's, there's not a lot to see, but then if you sort of um, translate across some of the things, like one of the other things um, that I think I would add to that list of things young women should be concerned about is the, the lockout changes for new start. And so last year, of course, it was this six months on, six months off idea with like, if you were going to be on the dole, um, or if you were going to get youth allowance, oh, I don't know that it extended, it was for new start, mm -hmm. and so you'd have to wait six months in that time you'd be, um, be job searching. So now it's been taken from six months to four weeks, and the treasurer said in his press conference, that day that that was like um, 
you said and we heard, and so this is what we've done. We've, we've shortened the lockout to this amount of time, um, though I think the sentiment in the public was that it shouldn't exist at all, um, because you know there is an entitlement um, to society to get that kind of government support, and it's important to a lot of young people, um, especially those who are studying and looking for work and in that situation. And that sort of a, that sort of situation, that sort of measure is going to affect um, lower income people, people that have, have who face greater challenges to access work in a way that is, is much more severe than, than the mainstream or the norm. For example, somebody that um, may be a migrant may um, and, and may be entitled to government support as, as a migrant who is now like a, a permanent resident may struggle 10, 20 times harder to find a job within that kind of time frame or may struggle so much harder to meet the, the high means of the activity test to be entitled to the new childcare subsidy. And that's just not factored, right? That's, and I mean, some of the other things that I think are really interesting to look at is also agricultural policies because young women in agriculture are almost never counted, though they actually account for more than something like 60 to 70% of the labor that actually happens in agriculture that's not acknowledged or paid, right? So the mother and the daughter on the farm that are actually doing a lot of the work and are not even acknowledged when we paint the picture of agriculture. If you talk about farmers, like who pops into your head? It well, actually okay. is <laughs> it's men, right? But yeah, the heavy lifters in the agriculture industry are actually women and they're not counted. And none of those agriculture measures factor for how the experience of women. They will be able to deduct the cost of their fencing. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. that's a measure. Yeah. Uh, I forgot the um, the violence against women um, st stuff. So um, the I think one of the biggest challenge biggest challenges that we face in looking at domestic violence and sexual assault funding at the moment is we can't tell you what the money is. What's the budget envelope to end violence against yeah. women in our communities? We can't tell you at a state and territory level, we can't tell you at a federal level. And, you know, Wally Daly said it on Tuesday night, show us the money. We want a document that tells us what it is. But more importantly, we want the money to be put in. And from the WISE perspective, we want the frontline services, but we also want this to end. We want primary prevention programs that fundamentally transform the attitudes of women and men and those who float between in our communities so that there is respect, so that we change this viewpoint that women's bodies are some level of entitlement, whether or not you're walking down the street or whether or not you're in your family. It is, there is no sense of entitlement that should adhere to a bloke for a woman's body. And we didn't see the, the primary prevention funding getting upped, despite the fact that we had fantastic leadership at the Council of Australian Governments just two weeks ago saying this is a critical issue for us in the Australian community and we need to address it. I think the other big losers in the budget are poor women around the world. We have got the biggest cut in the Australian aid budget history since the OECD started keeping records, biggest cut that we've ever seen. 70% cuts to programs in Africa and in the Asia and Pacific region, kind of on average 40% cuts. The only countries that we saw an increase in the aid allocations were those countries that have entered into arrangements with us to take us on. So yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, those aid cuts are huge. They were saying today at the, um, the Labor Women's Briefing that when John Howard was in government, it was 50, 50 cents to every $100 went into aid. Now it's going to be, it's 18 cents of every hundred dollars, and by the end of this budget round, it's going to be 11 cents, right? <laughs> so that's... Sorry, there's a question Sorry, there's a question up there? We had, um, at the moment, 20... I don't know if you're talking GNI or... We had 25 cents, and GNI was the highest in the Which is different from GDP, which is gross domestic yeah. product. It's a larger number. Yeah. 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 But also really interesting that those sorts of figures at a macroeconomic level 
only count kind of monetized contributions. So if you look at what we as women do in our households and what mm. men do in the households, the unpaid work does not get reflected mm. in these macro level measurements of a country's economic output. And that's one of the really significant factors that affects how we value the work that we do, the unpaid caring work. The un if we could transform attitudes towards unpaid caring work, first of all, the gender stereotypes which underpin them, which I talked about before, apparently you need anatomical features to be able to care. Um, but the other bit is you transfer that through and you look at what we pay people who offer caring work in our communities. And why is it that we pay less to somebody who's raising up the next generation or caring for our parents in a nursing home than we pay someone who comes and unplugs the cloth in our drain or fixes the wires that bring light to our house. Those care economy issues are fundamental to women's economic wellbeing mm -hmm. and also to challenging the gender stereotypes that shut men out of care work as well. I think that's really interesting, Caroline, because you've kind of touched on, I guess, the next stage of the budget process, which is advocacy. And I guess I'm interested in hearing from you and Hannah about the role that NGOs and specifically the women's sector play in that and, and how you approach the budget process when you're thinking about the groups that you represent and, and the outcomes that you want for them. Did you want to say anything to kick off that? Um, sure. I mean, I view the, the way the women's sector engages um, with the budget in three different ways. So firstly, we would be, um, you know, looking, after, looking out for our own funding. Secondly, we're um, doing no, no, it's really interesting because, you know, that is kind of that awful catch-22 where in the community sector often your funders are the government and then you're also trying to hold them to account. So, <laughs> sure. Yeah, so that was more of a chuckle of uh, commiseration. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're looking at for our own funding. Um, we are looking at for um, issues that we advocate on and looking to analyse the budget from a gendered perspective. And we're also looking to hold the government to account on um, policy priorities that they have committed to and see whether you know, they are showing the money as, um, has, as has been popularised this week. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for us as a women's organisation, um, we're not just concerned with expenditure, the expenditure side of the budget. Um, we put forth a vision for um, revenue raising and that is fundamental to how we, uh, our vision for the community as well. And so um, in our pre-budget submissions, we say you should spend money here, but you should be getting the money from um, this area as well. And um, we advocate for more progressive uh, tax reform. So working in the housing space, that's been um, changes to the capital gains tax exemption and um, restructuring of negative gearing. Um, so for us in the sector, um, the budget analysis has become more difficult difficult because the two chief mechanisms I saw uh, for a gendered analysis of the budget were, um, were the women's budget statement, which sort of captured all of these policy initiatives uh, for women. And there was also, I just have to refer to my notes because it's not something I say every day, the micro simulation of Australia's tax and transfer system, <laughs> <laughs> which is... Uh, this um, wonderful um, analysis that show that projects all of the tax and transfer decisions within the budget onto um, the population. And you can see, because women earn 20% less, you can see the impacts of these tax and transfer decisions on women. And um, last year, that, that for the first time in a long time, that analysis <coughs> wasn't included in the budget. Luckily, uh, NATSUM, did the, has the capacity to do that analysis and that is where months after the budget we actually had this evidence that the biggest impact fell onto single poor, uh, single poor mothers uh, through the tax and transfer changes. So for me they're the two chief key mechanisms that we can see what the gendered impacts of the budget are. You've got that, that uh, micro simulation and you've also got this wonderful this, this women's budget statement which um, tries to capture 
all of the issues, all of the policies that are about women, and it's about elevating women's issues into something that's of policy and political importance. They don't exist. Those two things don't exist anymore. And so, as a sector, we have had to step up and um, do do not only do the analysis ourselves, but also um, elevate the issue so that. Uh, women are in budget commentary, they're in post-budget commentary, they're in the language about the budget. Um, the other thing for us, the other thing about the budget is that we're not just looking at, issue, at policy areas that have had to be relegated to women. When we think of women's policy, I guess we're thinking violence against women, we're thinking paid parental leave, childcare, etc. For us, we make a huge effort to look at, to put a gender lens on every single policy area. Because at the end of the day, um, Women are not only impacted differently because we, um, impact, we interact differently with tax and transfer systems, but we rely more heavily on government services, on, on government and community funding. And so cuts to those services will disproportionately impact women. So as a sector, I suppose we're, we're getting better at looking at the budget as a, as a much broader thing than you know, piecemeal policies that are about, about uh, the whizzes. So that's code for multinational tax policy is a feminist issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I just said to you on that. <laughs> do, do you yeah. think that, Miranda? Like, I do think that. Could you tell Absolutely. us a bit about how you, how you feel that, I guess, gender equality plays a part in multinational? So, I mean, one could do... <laughs> you could do a very direct analysis. So there is a methodology called gender budgeting, uh, which is um, quite widely used and in fact it's used quite a lot in the development space. It's sort of been adopted by the World Bank and by the UN on it with its gender equality goals. And that is exactly doing what Hannah just described, that is looking at the impact of tax and transfer policy and other expenditure policy in the budget, specifically with a gender lens. Um, so at using sometimes using a micro simulation modeling process, which is a process where you bring all those settings together and you look at the ABS the statistical data about the population by gender, by where people live and all those other aspects in different households and you look at the immediate impact of the budget on those different uh, individuals. So uh, Australia was a pioneer in gender budgeting uh, in the 1980s uh, and uh, we don't do it anymore. Uh, really conservative governments tend not to do it, uh, but even Labor governments have not put resources into gender budgeting. Uh, we seem to have this family's discourse. So there's a very particular thing that it would be nice to fund and do uh, is to reintroduce gender budgeting in Australia, whether that's done in a civil society way or in a governmental way. So that's something that we're thinking about. I'm thinking about at TDPI as to how we might achieve that. But there's a broader issue here, which is this issue of sort of, so a lot of the work I do is on business taxation. Uh, and this whole issue of how do we fund government, really? and the most effective ways to, to tax, um, tax capital uh, and to really just raise it enough revenue. Uh, so, so Australia is currently engaged, like other G20 countries and the BRICS countries, um, with the OECD on this um, multinational base erosion project that you might have heard of, base erosion and profit shifting. Uh, so you've heard of the Googles and the Apples and the structures that uh, put money in tax havens. Uh, one of the measures in the budget is a, a, a bit of an anticipation of what we're going to see recommended to happen in a coordinated way by, before the end of the year. So the next G20 is in Turkey. Uh, the OECD is going to put its reports on this base erosion project to the G20 to make a decision uh, as to whether those countries will support these measures. Uh, and Australia, I, I mean, I hope that we actually might see a multilateral treaty really for the first time in tax, because countries hold tax very closely as a national sovereignty issue, uh, which might actually try to kind of capture some of the revenue on those, uh, in those global multinationals. The rule that they've put in the budget now is a bit of a tentative step in that direction, and it may not raise any revenue. They haven't projected any revenue from it. Because we don't know if it's going to work. This tax haven thing is when big multinational companies put their head office in a country that has lower taxes. It's so not usually a head office, but a subsidiary in the multinational corporate group. 
So we have this very flexible form called multinational corporation, which could have hundreds of subsidiaries located around the world. Uh, and so corporations can use legal transactions to, to locate their profit in those havens and take big deductions in countries like Australia. Um, anyway, it's a, yeah. It is a complex issue, <laughs> but uh, I, I think one of the good things about the budget, even though that rule may or may not work, is that Australia is staying engaged in that process, uh, and I think that's, that itself is a good thing from a gender perspective. Absolutely. And on the gender budgeting, just to come back to that again, because mm. I think that that's really critical, because one of the things about it is that gender budgeting asks before you make the policy, what the gender differentiated impact on the po of the policy on women and men is. And I think what we've seen in women's budget statements is it's a, it's a retrospective cobbling together of this is how the budget impacts women. Mm -hmm. um, and what we really wanted in, in gender budgeting was for governments to ask the question as they formulated the policy, mm -hmm. Will this have a disproportionate or different impact because of the gender of the, per you know, the people who ex experience the policy? Um, and you know, that's what we want. We want a whole of government approach so that from the very first moment that a policy is envisaged, people are saying, what's the difference for this, for blokes and for girls? Um, and, and that's really critical. From an NGO perspective, you know, we want, like, if, if governments did that, that would make our advocacy at this point much easier. That's why they don't do it. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> it's also why they don't put all of, you know, all of the money in for domestic violence and sexual assault into one document because it makes it way too um, easy for so us to hold. So otherwise they don't get to play the treasure hunt game, Yes, right? yes. But, you know, from a nuts and bolts advocacy perspective, the Y has, in the last couple of days, written media releases, done um, media interviews, has written to the crossbenchers. So, because we have a, um, a crossbench Senate situation, we, it depends on the politics of the day. Um, if you've got a Senate which is controlled, whoever is controlling the Senate is who we focus our attention on in um, the days after the budget because they're the people who can affect and create change, um, either in a major or in a nuanced way. Um, so, um, you know, we went this morning to the ALP Women's Budget Brief to hear what the ALP is saying and to um, have chats and begin strategies there. We've written to the Greens, we've ri written to the crossbenchers. That would be Yen. <laughs> did those initial emails and all of us working on the letters. Um, so it's, it's a, a full team event and looking to have meetings with folks in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, obviously still continuing to advocate on issues that have carried forward from the budget from last year as well. And I think that's particularly interesting when you do look at the advocacy. I think Yen's mentioned a couple of times that maybe the last budget was um, quite different in a lot of ways for the amount of effect that people power really did have. Yeah, and I'd love to hear from you what you think about, I guess, clicktivism or you know how we as young women can actually impact on the budget. Like, what can we do if we get really angry about a budget measure? Mm. How do we advocate for ourselves, I guess? I mean, I think I'm gonna take a step back from that question first and say that like, if you look at last year's budget compared to this year's budget, they're two like totally different political documents in the sense that the first year budget was about like how much how much can we shake everybody up and still like land with our feet on the ground for the Liberal government. And then this second budget, which and I mean people perhaps with a longer line of sight over government government would say that this one actually isn't as much a second term budget as a third term budget. So they're kind of playing towards this idea that we might see an early election, some of the commentary is saying, because this budget um, has played a big part, right? Small businesses mm. are a big voting block for the Liberal government. And so they play this big part that's hitting at this like main constituent um, base of voters and so sort of suggesting maybe a bit of anxiety or a bit of a plan to move to an early election. So even just looking at the difference between last year being this thing where it's like, how much can we 
God, how much can we, how much can we like, you know, get away with? And this one being like, oh, maybe we're going to try and like appease the masses a little bit, suggests that there is a strong amount of power that comes with understanding who you are to whom. Mm. If you're the constituent for a certain, um, you know, for a certain governor or a certain politician, then you've got a lot more leverage in that situation. Um, and one of the things that was um, really interesting to come out of the conversation we had with the um, with Therese from the Council of Single Mothers is that actually these childcare and F um, TV family tax benefit reforms are really, really going to hit single mothers hard in a way that would really, really be of interest to the National Party, mm -hmm. right? And I think if they come to understand that and both parties come to understand that, that you have this moment of sort of like, you know, what you have in your interest is in our interest and we can leverage off that. And social media is going to be this um, way that the pulse is kept for all those demographics and especially for young people. And so it's about young people identifying which of the politicians are most invested in appeasing us <laughs> and then leveraging that through widespread campaigning. So you're saying be strategic about it. Yeah. Don't just yeah. kind of like funnel yeah. all your anger into your own Facebook feed. Yeah, yeah. Or and don't just like angry tweet <laughs> like Joe Hockey <laughs> because actually oh, I it's... Right <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Be strategic and understand like where you have a where yeah where there's a politician that has a vested interest to appease your demographic, and as young people, you know, we can we can definitely there's definitely some some soft targets I think you know so. Yeah. Um, we will actually open up to questions from the audience, so please kick us off. Yeah, on the sort of topic of advocacy, as you sift through all the different issues that are causing various levels of rage and frustration at this point, I have a question. Is two parts. How do you decide? Um, you may have been in the budget lockup with us, um, <laughs> because uh, you know we always have this. Um, one of our staff who's not here tonight, you know, always has to bring me back down to earth because I kind of want to do this macro level and you know, kind of taking it all in, and we can't. Um, so you know, the Wire Australia press release doesn't talk about infrastructure, for example, <laughs> um, but. Um, I guess a part of it, the way I understand advocacy is that sometimes it's really, what's important is that you raise the issue, even though you know you'll lose, even though you know that um, it won't be popular, because the issue is important and someone has to start talking about it. Um, and, you know, if we had not started talking about paid parental, the, the YWCI first advocated for paid parental leave in 1913. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you've got to have a long game in social change. That was before the first income tax. <laughs> <laughs> the first income tax is 1950. <laughs> to fund World War One and widows' pensions. So there was a feminist side to that. <laughs> Sorry, it's the game. centenary this year. Only I would know that. We should have t-shirts, mate. We should start <laughs> hashtag yeah, the yeah, yeah. Spread the word. It's a thing to sell. It's part of our national infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> well, and look, look, the other thing is, like, I think we need, like, we need to get better about talking about tax. <laughs> and well, I'm not yes, to do no, that. no. But <laughs> also, the story of tax is that it supports social cohesion. Mm -hmm. And if you have a society where we don't have a taxation base and we don't have programs that support all of us, then society falls apart. Um, I think it's Cass Goldie who says that paying tax is the greatest act of love for your country. <laughs> <laughs> so, but however, you should do it even if you don't love your country. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 It's all part of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we decide what to, to, to focus on? Well, some of it's about um, what are the critical issues, what are the most kind of, what are the things that are going to have the greatest detrimental impact, or what are the things that are going to be positive that you want to draw attention to? Because, you know, we always try, you know, that whole notion of brick bats and bouquets, you should always try and focus on something good at the start, um, and then move into your kind of, well, these are the areas you could do better um, analysis. 
Um, and I, I think part of it for us is also where have we got a legitimate voice? Um, so, you know, as I said, we don't talk about infrastructure because actually the WISE policy platform hasn't got a really strong section on infrastructure. Um, but we do have a commitment as part of a global movement in over 108 countries around the world to care about the um, aid budget. So while our focus is primarily domestic, the Y is one of the few organisations that will run a kind of dualistic agenda of looking at the impact in Australia and looking at the impact outside of Australia. Most agencies either focus on external or internal. So one of our challenges is that we are a bit of a kitchen sink organisation. And so how do you find a coherent, na coherent narrative so that politicians can understand what you would likely be talking about and therefore be open to receiving your message. Um, but it's also about the work that we've done beforehand. Mm -hmm. Could I add another like, yes. lens to that? Um, I think the other thing about working out how to pick your battles is probably about looking at what battles you're more likely to win. So um, Richard Dennis, who's the head economist at the Australia Institute recently wrote a book and it was all about how the crossbench strategy was this like the most important thing to Australian politics and I think there's a, bit of, there's a few nuggets of gold there because the way that we've kind of got it set up right now is that all these policy decisions and all of the numbers line up so that they all trickle down to these eight people who are the balance of power in the Senate, right? And Jackie Lambie and Ricky Muir are two, are two of those, yeah? Just so if that hadn't said it yet, <laughs> that this is how democracy works. Um, so it's quite common. So is Clive Palmer, yeah, and, and so is like Bob Day and Lionel, <laughs> such as it is. Yes. <laughs> and so there's this situation where these few people who have some very, very distinctive politics actually hold... Or no politics. Or no too. politics. Or politics that's still like coming oh, soon. Come on, to, to come come on. on. you can't <laughs> say that a two-line policy isn't politics. <laughs> I'm yeah. Well, I, I mean... Ricky Muir has been a really interesting advocate recently around housing issues that we saw. Yeah. You know, and I think he's an interesting advocate, not quite. <laughs> in, in, yeah. in that he, when he understood the issue, he was able to come to the fore and be like, this is something that is, is important to the common person and I'm going to be the representative for that. And PUP have been were fundamental in you know, in blocking higher education yeah. deregulation. And so yeah. there, there, was a, there was a strategy that was played there where it was like, this is an important issue for us and we're going to focus it in on the crossbench because they're the ones who are going to be the linchpin about whether or not it happens. Mm. So some, some of these things are actually just going to come down to like what the situation is for who's going to make the decision within that small group of people. Actually, and it's why it comes back to, you know, the work the Y does around the election, the first part of our our process is enrol. Young people are disproportionately absent from the electoral roll. Now I'm pretty sure that everyone on this panel was probably pre-enrolled. Um, I still have the letter in my scrapbook. <laughs> but, you know, enrol and then cast an informed vote. And I think also, you know, the Y made a submission to the joint parliamentary inquiry into the conduct of the election, which is convened after election, every election. And this year it was super, or this past election, it was super critical because we did see the construction of the Senate change in a really amazing way that resulted in people who had perhaps not anticipated that they would be elected being elected <laughs> and having this really critical vote because they hold the balance of power. And you know, my hat is genuinely off to the journeys that they have been on because they have they found themselves, so they got elected, and they are now having to educate themselves to understand what the balance of power. Now, I'm a Senate girl. I love the fact that we have a balance of power um, because it's that accountability moment um, and so, you know, electoral reform is a feminist issue as tax is a feminist <laughs> issue. Um, and so, you Those know, are definitely the can I just make a comment about um, that? One of the things that I think is a new mechanism that people may not be aware of is since 2012, we have a new institution in budget politics, and it's called the Parliamentary Budget Office. 
<coughs> uh, and it is a very well resourced, surprisingly well resourced and technically capable organisation that costs policies for opposition and minor parties. So someone like Ricky Muir would never have been able to get a handle on policy, let alone have any ideas costed. Similarly, the Greens, uh, except in the pre-election period, could not uh, get policy costed. And even in opposition, Labor would have to fund its own policy costings. So now we have a parliamentary budget office, and that's what it does. It does some other strategic research about longer term fiscal sustainability of the government, which is quite interesting if you're into that sort of thing. It's useful work, uh, which is all public as well. So the cost, so one of the things you can do as voters is communicate with the minor parties and the independents about particular policy platforms and ask them to consider it and to cost it. <coughs> and sometimes that'll be confidential and sometimes those costings have to be publicly released. So that may be a mechanism that organisations could use, even though they can't cost something for the Equality Rights Alliance, but if you were to talk to a political party about policies, you could actually potentially get those policies uh, assessed and costed in a really quite technically effective way. It's a lot cheaper than a consultant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Your taxes at work. Your taxes at work. Excellent. Is there, yep, another question there? Yeah, I have a question about, um, you were talking about gender budgeting before, and my question was, how do you resuscitate that exercise? And Miranda, you mentioned that you were doing some work around that currently. So, Tax and Transfer Policy Institute, although we're called a policy institute, we're really a research organisation, but we have a pretty small budget, so we couldn't cost something like that ourselves, but we're, we're running a workshop, an academic workshop in September on gender equality and tax and transfer policy. And we're bringing, so what I'm doing is bringing together a lot of academics from around the country who do work on various aspects, sort of economists and political scientists and so on, who do work on those things. And we will try to communicate with government about that. Uh, what happens in some countries is that it's government funded, so it's a part of the government process. It's a, and as Caroline said, it's important that it happens through the pre-budget process. So it's, part, it's good to analyse retrospectively to understand what the impact is. But it's better to inform the policy up front, of course. I don't know. We should think about whether it's worth having civil society organisations uh, actually fund something like that. Um, and whether we can make a home for it or work with some of the distributional modelling technical people like that said, uh, who might be able to do that. Um, it's a project for us to consider. Yeah. Sophie? Um, Tara, you mentioned the Morning at the Labor um, gender uh, analysis, Tanya Plibersek mentioned about a gender, uh, sorry, a GP co payment by another name. I'm wondering if anybody has any information on that. There's a pharmaceutical benefits payment. Yeah, and no, I don't, but I have the document here. So let me just have, have a look. I'm prepared. So. Let, give me a moment, I'll come. <laughs> question on notice. Can we come back to that one? Does anyone else have an Alice up back? Um, I have a question about um, tax avoidance. I was yeah. thinking you were speaking to me more about that. You said you didn't think it would work. Or you weren't sure. Oh, I didn't say I didn't think it would work. But it's not easy to make yeah. it work. Um, so is, it, is there a way that policy could be improved to make it work? Or is it a case of national cooperation? Yeah, a bit of both probably. So what the government has done with this multinational tax avoidance law is they've extended an existing rule in the income tax, which is already there, which is a general anti-avoidance rule. And what those rules try to do is they try to identify whether it's individuals or corporate taxpayers. Uh, if a scheme's been entered into that uh, gets some kind of benefit, tax benefit, like an exemption or a deduction or something, uh, and the purpose of that was to avoid the operation of the normal law, the commissioner has power. So you give the authority more power to override the transaction. So they've drafted an extension to that, uh, which says it doesn't have to be the dominant purpose anymore. It could just be one of the purposes of the transaction uh, is to uh, get a tax benefit, avoid the tax law. Um, and they've also applied it to only very large corporates at this stage, so over a billion dollars of global turnover. So that is literally Google, Apple, Starbucks. I mean, you know, those are the companies, the big miners, are the companies that are, are potentially covered by this. 
Uh, what it says is if there is some activity in Australia and they are going to be selling some goods or you know, streaming some content or whatever in Australia uh, and they've got another entity in a haven and a purpose that looks like they've structured the deal so as to get the money into the haven, then the commissioner can come in and, and reassess that. So that law might work on its own terms. That is, if that situation happens, the commissioner has power. <coughs> But multinationals can change their behaviour, right? So the corporate financial managers of the large corporate, they may make a decision not to locate any activity in Australia. No sales activity at all, have it all online. Have all the employees uh, in Singapore. I'm not saying that will happen, but when you introduce a new rule into the law that has its own boundaries, you will get a behavioural response by the tax. So there's, that's the first question, and the second is just enforcement. Uh, but I think for these corporates, the rule could, this rule could work, and there's this 100% penalty, so they essentially double the tax rate. So really, they're not trying to raise revenue from this rule, they're trying to get these corporates to just pay regular company tax on some of their, their Australian profit. So you might get them to do that, but on the other hand, they might just move offshore or change the structure of the transaction. 